Thank you for listening to the Cosmetics Business Podcast. For early access to episodes, exclusive beauty news stories, analysis, trend reports and award-winning magazines, subscribe to cosmeticsbusiness.com. That's cosmeticsbusiness.com. Hello and welcome to the Cosmetics Business Podcast, a monthly roundup of the biggest stories, trends and talking points in beauty. Coming to you from our London Bridge studio, my name is Sarah Parsons and I'm sitting here with fellow cosmetics business journalists, Julia Ray, Amanda Pauley and Alessandro Carrara. And in today's episode, we're going beyond the headlines to take on the biggest stories of the past month, from 10-year-olds using anti-aging products to divisive comments from L'Oreal CEO and Pat McGrath's viral makeup moment. Now don't forget, make sure to stay on to the end where we reveal our favourite new products of the month. And the past month, a story that has captivated the public and the industry is the apparent surge of children as young as eight years old using anti-aging products and showing off their luxury skincare hauls on TikTok. It's been called an epidemic uh, when Gen Alpha, the majority of which are under 13 years old, are buying luxury brands such as Drunk Elephant and Glow Recipe, ruining displays, particularly at Sephora, and being rude to staff and customers. Um, I had a look into this, and it's actually very difficult to quantify this behaviour because you can't track the data because they're at such a young age. But their influence is actually groundbreaking because by the end of 2024, so this year, uh, when the oldest Gen Alphas will be 14, uh, they will have 5.39 trillion will be spent on them annually around the world. And that's according to estimates from McCrindle. And uh, so in currently, in specifically on Sephora and the kids at Sephora hashtag, uh, that has been viewed more than 55 million times on TikTok. What are your instinctive feelings on it? So, yeah, I think there is an interesting debate to be had about to what level is this an industry thing? To what level can we influence this as an industry? And to what level is it the responsibility of the parents? And personally, I'm very, very strongly on the side that it is really down to parental control uh, rather than brands which are technically offering adult skincare to make their for example, packaging product names less attractive to a young audience. I'm thinking things like Glow Recipe or Sol de Janeiro, uh, which, you know, have bright colours, they're fun packs. They will appeal to tweens in a similar way that they appeal to those people in their early 20s, which is their, their target key audience. Uh, so it's not up to the brand to police how they look and how they promote. I think it's really down to the parents to withstand pester power because that is nothing that's new. What is new is the social media aspect of it mm. and just how broad and global this goes. Absolutely. I think also there's been talk of people banning children from Sephora. Have you seen that? Yeah. So people on social media are calling for if under 16 year olds to be banned. And I think that's just going to have a, well, that's not plausible. They can't police that. But firstly, it's too extreme. Um, and secondly, well, how, how are they going to police that? And then that will just make people want to go there even more. You know, you, you know how that works with, with banning anything with teenagers. It just yeah. makes it really enticing for yeah, them. Yeah, of course. You will just see kids and they'll just dare each other to run in, won't they? Could you imagine <laughs> getting ID checked at Sephora? <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, though, I, from a, an employee's point of view, working at whatever retail shop it is and seeing gangs of tweens like running around the shops like and these are expensive products opening them up opening up new products putting all their fingers in the samples and not treating the environment with respect it is a problem yeah I think there's a few things to it one you don't want to deter them completely because they're going to be the next generation of customers and you want to get them young and keep them loyal especially as a retailer because there's so much competition out there that you kind of want them to come into the store and start their beauty journey with you and work up. So I don't think a ban, and like you say as well, they'll just dress up and make themselves look older. to like come in, <laughs> like, you know, like going to a club. So but it's, it's also difficult as well because some of the videos I've seen, these kids are like 10, 11, and they've got Amex cards. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Like that's the problem in itself. There's just a lot of layers to this where it's difficult. I think as well, kids misbehaving in stores is nothing new. I'm going to do Primark as an example, and no offence to Primark, but sometimes you go in there and you see kids running around, they trash the place, you know, sometimes they're fighting or whatever. 
but it doesn't really put you off because I think you know it's like a family orientated fashion retailer. You know you're going to see kids in there. But a lot of the time the parents are with them and they do put them in control. I think Sephora is a bit more of a mid premium mm. environment. So that's the problem is that you don't expect to see that kind of behavior in that kind of shop. Mm -hmm. Very tricky. And also, like Julia said, it's the point of like, it's not really the brand's fault. I think a part of it is these things go viral on TikTok. And then it's just kids see it at school and they want what the other kids have got. It's like when we were younger, you know, everyone had like a Jane Norman carrier bag to carry their PE kit in. God, I forgot about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like, or a Nike string bag and everyone had to have it. So I feel like it's just the thing at the moment with kids in school is where before it might have been like stationery or trainers or like bags. Like now it's skincare. I think there's peer pressure as well for kids to be trying these things because they see their peers trying them. So there's just so many layers to it. And also we don't really know if it's happening in other beauty retailers because so much has been about Sephora. So that's another element to it. But obviously the being rude to the staff and yeah, the testers, some of them are gross. So it is a problem, but I can't really see like a clear solution. I don't think there is a clear solution because Sephora is making money at the end of the day. The other thing which I think is interesting is that um, do 10-year-olds really need to be having a skincare routine? I guess, well, sun cream, obviously, in the summer to pr protect their skin. And they do have very thin skin. Their skin, I'm not a scientist here, so please <laughs> feel free to correct me, <laughs> listeners. Um, their skin is developing, as it were. Obviously, they haven't reached, reached puberty yet, a lot of them, so they haven't go, got those issues but yeah, sun cream, perhaps a, a very gentle wash and some gentle moisturiser, nothing more. But I think with these teens or tweens, sorry, it's less about actually about the skincare and more about the collection, as it were. Because what they're gravitating towards are, yeah, those pink colours, those fruity colours. And so it's more about the play aspect of it. Bioma, one of them, which was originally designed for teenagers, those and very gentle skincare for teenagers, that's been described as looking like Lego. I was literally just and, thinking building blocks, like yeah. literally. Yeah, exactly. Looking like Lego. And then other things I've seen that are very popular with this age group is the minis. So mini drunk elephants. Millennials are saying, I used to play with Polly Pockets. Well, they're tiny things as well, like these minis. And so there are correlations between the two. So I think it's less actually about the skincare and more about wanting to play grown up. Cool. So I actually spoke to Mark Curry and he's the co-founder of skincare brand The Inky List on the topic. And he recently wrote a white paper exploring why Gen Z are particularly engaged with skincare. But as a result of that, he uh, explored Gen Alpha as well. So I will just play that for us. And in terms of Gen Alpha, we're seeing a lot of reporting about kids go wild in Sephora or yeah. <laughs> or 10 year olds using retinol and um, not much concrete research done on it. I could imagine because that's probably because of data and their age group that it can't really be done. But um, what's your stance on, on that conversation? My stance is this is, uh, have they not always been? You know, have kids not always wanted to be older and like been in their mums and their sisters and their cousins and their grandmas makeup and beauty bags and like played. Um, I think it's always gone on. It's just magnified times a trillion with kind of how, you know, certain influences and then the algorithms take shape and then all of a sudden it's a thing and then the thing just becomes a thing anyway. And there's a bit of a kind of, um, you know, an intentionality to it. And it just happens because everyone's talked about it so much. And I think the um, the thing for me would be, it's a good thing, you know, if, if people are engaging early in what does it take to really look after your skin and prevent all the things that we probably did to our skins and bodies that we shouldn't have done. It's a really great thing. It's a really bad thing if they're using stuff that shouldn't be used for them because they don't need it. Uh, but that's that's like any at any time in life. It's just exemplified when you know their skin's a bit thinner and they're growing still, and you know they haven't even figured out their own cells, let alone you know what X influencer is doing on their face. So you know there's there's, there's pros and cons to it. I do I think it it happens anyway. It's just been exemplified and it's been whipped up by everyone now. Everyone's talking about it. 
But what I do know about Gen Z from the papers and what I can postulate about Gen Alpha, uh, f- uh, consequentially, is they're also got a very small attention span as well. And so, um, you know, what could be here today could be gone tomorrow. And I think, I think that was the whole point coming back to why did I do this in the first place? You know, big fan of kind of being respectful and respectful of the noise, but really hearing the signal. And I think for me, the noise is loads of 10 year olds are buying stuff that they shouldn't be. And it's really expensive, Ah, Uh, which is fine. And, you know, brands and businesses should pay attention to that and, you know, take their brand stance and deploy it, you know, sensibly to that trend. But it doesn't mean that trend is going to be around forever. But, But I think what will be around as per the paper is, the meaning of science in how things come to life and how consumers expect to be talked to and what they expect in different channels, et cetera, et cetera, in order to engage with them on a meaningful level and convince them to do business with the brand, the product, whatever that what that business is. Is that something you've got to be aware of as a co-founder of Inky is that Gen Alpha demographic and how you are going to target them? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, and it's a live question for exactly this reason. But fundamentally, you know, and I say this as a dad of a daughter who is slap bang in the middle of Gen Alpha, there's a there's a morality to it, which is you have to be cognizant that this exists and and those people are being allowed to see certain content without really leading them. And so our perspective is we're just going to keep doing what we're doing, knowing that, you know, we're about education first. We're about making sure people get the right education about what's good for them. And then if they decide to buy from us or from someone else, that's fine by us. Um, But they're just a younger version with different behaviors of a version that would naturally had gravitate to us in terms of those Gen Gen Z population. And so, you know, I think brands have to be careful not to kind of get sucked into moments. Um, And they really have to know why do they exist and how should they show up to certain consumers and just be maniacal on executing against that. Um, Be respectful of the trends. And, you know, if, if it makes sense for your brand to do something in that space, do it, but do it with good conscience. And if not, don't bother, you know, stick to true, true to being you. If you've been targeting old millennials or Gen Xs, don't start to think now, oh yeah, I can hit Gen Alpha. Um, because it, it kind of won't make sense and you'll just, you know, blur the lines of, of what you're trying to do. Yeah. Some of the brands that keep getting brought up that Gen Alpha are particularly keen on, um, brightly coloured packaging, some look like Lego. Uh, fun names, uh, fruit flavored things as well. Um, how much of that is responsible for this Gen Alpha interest in skincare? I don't know. I mean, speaking from where I've come from with the research with the paper, visual visual cues are really important to these people. Um, but I also think there's a there's a lot of crossover with, you know, what's of the moment, what is, what's their friends buying and they just want to buy the same thing. And, you know, are we swinging back to shelfie? You know, shelfie, we haven't talked about shelfies for a couple of years, a few years, I don't know. Um, so perhaps it's a swing back to that. But, you know, I think, I think the, the packaging thing is interesting. And if you look at the brands like, you know, drunk bioma bubble, etc. They they all all very similar looking, um, and you know they are of the time and are having having a moment. But <clears throat> there's also other brands that aren't, and it, I think it will cycle. And I think it, it, again, it comes back to what's just um, micro versus macro trend. Because I think you know all uh, I think all colours in the world are welcome, and I just think would brightly coloured packaging stick out for a young person probably um is that going to stay the same forever probably not as well i think there's um you know a huge market and i just think it you know if it's in capturing people to try something new and it's the right product for them great um if it's not bad 
you know, and I hope then consumers go back and kind of say, okay, what should I be looking out for beyond mm. just what's in the packaging? Because I really mm. should be concerned about what juice am I putting on my face? Absolutely. And have you been, or has Inky been impacted by this trend? Yeah, I think we've seen we've seen solid growth um, consistently now over over like the holiday season before and and into this new year as well. But I don't think we've. I couldn't really. It's not Gen Alpha specifically. No, I couldn't uh, attribute it to that directly. But you know, without any evidence, it's just been consistent. Um, uh, we've had a couple of launches that have gone really well. That could have, could or could not have been bought by Gen Alpha. We don't know. It's also, you know, I think it, it is. And again, remembering that you you can't track their data either, um, which is tricky. Um, and so I, I think it's you know qualitative things from people, and you know it's dominant thought, dominant thought theory, right? Because you know when you buy a red car, you can't help but notice red cars on the road. If all everyone's talking about is ten-year-olds buying stuff, then and you see it once, you're like, yeah, there is loads of ten-year-olds buying stuff, but you just might have seen it once. It hasn't altered what is actually happening in reality around you. It's just the perception that's happening. So, um, you know, I, I don't think we could pull it apart. So, what did you think about Mark's take on that? I thought what he said about education was really, really important because essentially that's something Inky has been doing from the very start. It's really part of its brand ethos. And I think that is really helpful in this context as well, because essentially with the education aspect, you can tell these 10, 11, 12 year olds that, yes, retinol is a great skincare ingredient, but you're not going to need it for another 15 years. And you can you can hop on that bandwagon when you when it's necessary for you. But right now, you just don't need it. And I do think this brings up a whole other aspect of why are these children so scared of aging? What is our society teaching them at this stage in their life that they can't think of anything worse than naturally aging? That's a concern as well. Not just this, all the influencers they may be seeing on a day to day basis who are probably setting standards. Absolutely. When I was younger, my bellwether as to what was really cool and what I really, really wanted to buy were my peers. Whereas these kids, they're seeing people who are college age, influencers who are five, six, seven years older than them. They're going to like similar things. They're going to have a similar aesthetic, but their skincare needs are going to be different, but they're aping them. And that's an issue as well, I think. Were you guys super concerned about aging when you were small children? <laughs> no, I wanted to look older. I wanted to sneak into that club, but that, that was what I wanted to do. <laughs> no, I never really thought about it. To be honest, when I was their age, it was all just about blue mascara do you know what I mean <laughs> oh being able to God. get away with your nails painted in school but I think what he said about the issues always been there but it's just magnified now is probably true because I remember being that age and rifling through my sister's makeup bag and like putting her foundation on and it's like three shades too dark for me and stuff <laughs> but we've all got a camera in our phones now we've all got the ability to film everyone we can see into everybody's lives all the time which actually you know 15 years ago that wasn't a thing so I think as well it's it's access, it's seeing this stuff. And like Julia said, they're seeing influencers who are older and they're admiring them and they see them as aspirational. But then also, you know, there are some Gen Alpha influencers who actually do skincare content that's right for the age. I think it'd be nice to see a bit more of them come to the fore. There is a great one I follow, I just can't remember her name, which is such a shame, but she's very cute and she's based in Canada. And she does that. It's just stuff that's completely relevant for age group. But she also ties it in with talking about boys that she likes at school. That's and cute. it's very sweet and how she's building up confidence to text one of them. So I think uh, there are some out there doing it. But I, just, I think we're not hearing them because obviously there's this other issue at play. But yeah, his insight was interesting. I 100% agree with brands not jumping on Gem Alpha. If they have, like, the, like he said, if they have a target demographics, say older millennials or, you know, even older than that, stick with it because it's not going to be like a long term. Yeah, it, it doesn't make sense financially, I feel, just to uh, to hop on the trend while it's hot. Because it was a surprise move, like Drunk Elephant is the one that gets brought up a lot, I think, because A, because of the price point, 
the premium brand and that a lot of uh, younger consumers are engaging with it. It's got a fun name and they can make smoothies, which is mixing some of the products together and creating a mess and everything else. But it's that interaction play element. And so when all of this initially came about, Drunk Elephant didn't shy away from it. They didn't say, oh, no, you should not be using our products. Actually, what they said was our products are for everyone. It just depends on which ones. And so they created Instagram posts and was educational for young consumers. So I thought that was an interesting move. The fact that they, even though it was very much the quint, one of the quintessential millennial brands, it was at the time when it first launched very novel of its time. Uh, for that millennial age group, and um, but the, how they're not shying away from a younger audience. I think that hits both bases that we we're talking about, which is one, the importance of education, but also, um, as Amanda was saying earlier, not to alienate your future audience as well. And that brings us nicely onto another viral moment that happened this month. Julia, do you want to take us away? Yes. Yeah, so from children playing at being adults to adults playing at being dolls, we had a Paris Fashion Week uh, took place in January very recently. And you know how every now and then there is just a runway show that sends the fashion world into a complete frenzy? Well, that kind of moment happened uh, very recently with uh, the Maison Martin Margea show, uh, which was under John Galliano. Uh, that John Galliano, he's the Fashion <laughs> House's long-term creative director. And it was it was pure Galliano. It was the vibe was coquettes of the Parisian underground. We're talking corsets, teased, big candy floss hair and these kind of Victorian style flared heels. So from a fashion perspective, really Galliano. And it was very exciting. It was closed by Gwendolyn Christie, who is my absolute number one fashion girl crush. But why am I talking about fashion? We are, we are a beauty podcast after all. As you mentioned, Pat McGrath earlier, did the makeup look for this show. Pat McGrath, obviously the makeup artist and brand founder. And this has just gone absolutely viral. So there's one TikTok video, uh, she's posted a couple, um, has McGrath, um, of her working on a model backstage. It's been viewed 3.2 million times already, oh. which is absolutely wild. Mm. So this look, it's basically been described in various different places as alien skin, glass skin and porcelain doll skin, which is why I mentioned dolls. But personally, when I hear porcelain, I feel like it conjures up maybe this kind of matte bisque porcelain look. This particular aesthetic is so glistening and shiny. It is a glazed porcelain look. And the, it looks kind of like the models have had this thin layer of wax over their face, sort of House of Wax style, if anyone remembers that movie. And... Basically, this ethereal porcelain doll skin has been glazed over other doll-like features. They're so kind of sulky, pursed cupid's bow mouths, berry shades, pencil-thin eyebrows. You have these kind of jeweled, coloured eyeshadows all the way up to the arch as well. And just daubed colour on the cheeks uh, in kind of pinks and yellows. But my favourite part of this, and I don't know whether anyone has seen this, either listening or, or you guys as well, is the aftershow videos of the models just peeling mm. everything off. So satisfying. Oh, it's fantastic. Like the second skin, it's like shedding a skin. And this has inspired so many makeup uh, fans to try out this look. Um, McGrath has posted a few homages on her um, Instagram and TikTok accounts. Huda Katan uh, has posted tutorials via her account. So it's not just McGrath, it's lots of people recreating this look and then just having fun peeling it off. So how was this created? It's a bit of a mystery. So online sleuths have suggested a couple of things. One was Liquid Glass from Cryolan, which is a special effects makeup brand. But uh, apparently, uh, McGrath has alleged that this was achieved via a concoction of various different kind of watered down peel off formulas, uh, watered down peel off mask formulas even. And glimpses of backstage videos have indicated that there's airbrushing involved as well to achieve this perfect glaze. Yeah, there's seven layers of airbrushing. Fantastic. I mean... However it's created, I feel like this has been the makeup moment of the year. And it taps into things like ugly beauty, coquette core. It's so gooey and it's so fun. And I really want to see where this kind of level of creativity goes next in beauty, because I feel like it's really upped recently. Do you guys find it a little bit uncanny as well? Yeah, well, like Uncanny Valley Beauty. Yeah, absolutely. It's weird, but it's wonderful. I felt that it 
weird, yes, but it transcends so many genres of art and film and, and literature and history and all sorts. Like you've got the nod to the 1920s, you've got the fantasy of the porcelain doll, you've got the, you know, the exaggerated glass skin, which is so aspirational right now. You've got the large eyes. And then you've also got something that transcends like different cultures. Like whilst, yes, it's the Victorian element to it and, and the 1920s uh, Western cinema, but something about it could almost be like a geisha or or more um, Eastern Asian culture as well. So it just it's, it transcends so many countries, genres, everything. I thought it was fantastic. It's, it's wonderful. And I just want to try it out so I can peel it off my face. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether anyone else feels the same, like that glue, you know, when you used to get glue on your hands or wax on your hands and peel it off. It's like that, but in an adult way. The biggest guilty pleasure, isn't it? Pulling off a mask. Oh, yeah, exactly. You say. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, and also, um, Pat McGrath has been involved in kind of some really standout look recently. I think it was uh, Doja Cat. Pat covered her in these red crystals all over her face. It looked absolutely fantastic. And I feel like uh, McGrath, along with Isamaya French, they're just creating these amazing uh, red carpet and runway looks, which are just so artistic. So, yeah, leading the vanguard there, I'd say. Also coincides with the product launch that's happening as well. She hasn't said what the product is yet at the time of this recording anyway. Uh, people thought her product would be the the masks that she used, but it's not that. Apparently it was applied afterwards. So there is a product launch coming. There's something about this, though, what as well as the art itself, because this look was art. It wasn't about looking pretty or ugly. It was just art. But from a marketing perspective, it was genius because it tapped into that mystery element of what is it? The fact that we're like social media sleuths trying to fi find out what it was. And not only that, then there was a what is her product launching? So teasing that one of the biggest teasers of the year. And I felt it's really tied into a few other campaigns that we've seen recently about this idea of mystery. Elf recently um, did a mockumentary about a cosmetic criminal. And so they did a 15 minute long video and it was like, who stole my makeup? And it was super slick and it was went all over social media. So there's that one. And then Charlotte Tilbury did a similar kind of thing. I'm not sure if you've seen that, but. It's divided opinion because it was released about the same time as Elf. So ironically, Elf, known for its dupes, actually people thought Charlotte Tilbury for once was copying Elf. Mm -hmm. And so what they <laughs> what she did was, a, well, some influencers received a PR box and it had the lip liners on one side of the box and the lipsticks to correlate with the lip liners were missing. And it didn't happen with all of the influencers though, but apparently... It was part of the Hollywood heist. And so she filmed herself in a mockumentary style, similar to Elf, like a police investigation. And there was one with the CEO and there was one of different members of Charlotte Tilbury's team on social media. And then a while later, these influencers received another PR package with um, witness evidence bags and the lipsticks were found in there. So this part of this mystery of teasing launch, I think, is all tied in together. Yeah, the only other thing I'd say about it is that she's definitely pushing the boundaries of what you can do in terms of application and creativity around makeup artistry. At McGrath. And I, yeah, and I think the sheer amount of MUAs who have been inspired and have started to deliver incredible takes that are elevating the look again has been amazing. Like my feed's been full of it. So it just shows that um, the industry never stops innovating. Like there's always going to be a new creative look and it's exciting that we've had one so early into the year. And I love the way McGrath has shared a lot of these DIY versions that people have been posting as well. I feel it shows a real camaraderie in the industry and appreciation of their appreciation as it were. Absolutely. And really, um, yeah, tapping into that community because she has an incredibly loyal fan base and she's known the mother of makeup artists after all. Uh, speaking about launches, um, Pamela Anderson has launched in skincare this year. I know, Alessandra, you've got some thoughts on that. Yes. So, Pamela Anderson, star of Baywatch. She has been brought on as the new co-founder of the minimalist beauty brand Sonsi Skin. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Sonsi Skin? I think so. Brilliant. Not only that, she now has a stake in the business and she's going to be working alongside it, sort of raise awareness of its sort of brand ethos and mission and... I guess right off the bat, I really want to get your guys' view on this, is that 
How can you be a co-founder of a business that's already a year old? <laughs> I think as we discussed in our debut podcast, uh, just a call out there for anyone who wants to revisit that or hasn't heard it yet, there might be a bit of consumer fatigue setting in with celebrity brands in cases where they're potentially not as authentic as they could be. I feel at like this route, when like a celebrity like Pamela discovers a brand that they really love and then kind of hitches their wagon to something that's already up and going, it's potentially going to have a greater level of success because I think for anyone, whoever you are, whether you're Pamela Anderson or Jared Leto, whoever it is, launching a brand is a huge undertaking, uh, regardless of your profile. And this way of doing it is more about backing a brand with a view to getting this return on a mutually beneficial partnership. And I feel it's quite smart, to be honest. I think I'm a bit confused by the title as well. I feel like it's another term on creative director or a creative consultant or something like that. You could have any other title apart from co-founder, I feel, you know. <laughs> and it just puts me in mind because I had a similar reaction when Simon Rex, he is an American actor who starred in films like Scary Movie and Red Rocket. He was brought on as co-founder of a brand called Mox Skincare. Um, I'm not sure if you guys remember. And even then, I was a bit like, hmm, this brand has been around for a very long time and he's now co-founder. So yeah, I think it's an interesting, yeah, I guess it's an interesting move, but maybe it adds a little bit more of an authority to the position or maybe it sort of, yeah, legitimizes it a little bit more versus just a brand ambassador or something like that. I think so. I think there are a lot of famous faces out there that are, as you say, brand ambassadors, the face of, et cetera, of a beauty brand, whereas this legitimizes their position and it also kind of feels like a bit of maybe a reboot for the brands involved as well. Also a reboot for Pamela as well, because the moment she's she's known for being incredibly glamorous, heavily made up woman from the 90s. And she's having this change in dialogue, claiming this narration of her um, that we've seen for several months. And we could say that is a part of a marketing stunt for the brand or is it actually part of a reinvention of Pamela Anderson. And she's gone to makeup free at several fashion shows, at different awards. And at Paris Fashion Week, she even cited uh, Victoria Beckham as the queen of reinvention. And so Pamela Anderson, she's, she's going through this moment of embracing her ranch that she posts on Instagram. And I think she's got a TV show over in America about it as well. And so this more, I don't have a better word for it, but natural and more, she's always already been an activist for a long time, um, but she's embracing that side even more. And her being an investor and co-founder is part of this narrative to show that, hold on, she is a very intelligent, savvy woman rather than being a face of a brand or she's just founding a celebrity brand, which people are so tired of. And they know that a lot of the time that celebrity is actually just signed some papers and signed off some products and aren't in the, the nitty gritty yeah, of it. Yeah, that Pamela is more than just her face and her body, which I don't know whether anyone saw the recent documentary, but it really gave you an insight into the kind of person she was. And she was an introspective, intelligent, actually quite a shy woman, which was completely at odds with her public persona for so many years. So I feel like this is, it's not so much reinvention as maybe embracing the authentic Pamela. And I do agree with you kind of what's chicken and egg with regards to uh, this position and with regards to Sancy. But um, I do think there is an authenticity. I could be proved wrong, but looking at that documentary, I feel there's an authenticity there. And probably it's all just a part of her really going... I've got this far in life, I've got to this stage, I want to be authentically me. And it's a rhetoric that we see time and time again of women uh, in Hollywood in particular who have reclaimed their narrative as they've got older. But also there's been a sad nostalgia of women who unfortunately passed away too young, Marilyn, Amy Winehouse, who never had the chance to do that. I like it as well because I think whether it's a PR move or not, she's making it more acceptable or making it feel like for women it's more acceptable to just go out naturally as you are to not feel like you have to put loads of makeup on or present a certain face to the world and I think that can't be a bad thing in a world where there's so much pressure in terms of how you look how you should present yourself it's quite good it's pro-aging I think she looks beautiful to turn up to those events where the pressure is so high to look so glam and so amazing she looks stunning anyway so I think it's a great move by the brand because her skin looked flawless that's all anyone could talk about was how flawless her skin looked so naturally people will search and see what she's using so I think it's quite clever really 
I super agree with you. And particularly in an industry where there is so much pressure, um, getting it wrong and having all that stress on yourself, it's not good for your mental health. So having an ambassador, having someone that you can look to who's, yeah, who's representing something different, you know, I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. And whilst we talk about pro-aging and whether it is hopefully here to stay, but whether it actually is or not is another thing. And whilst we've had great ambassadors, Helen Mirren gets mentioned all the time as the face of L'Oreal and Jane Fonda. They're gorgeous women and they're incredibly successful women. They're incredibly heavily made up women. And the fact that you don't have to wear makeup every day and yet you can still feel beautiful. On the flip side, though, you can say that Pamela Anderson is an incredibly wealthy woman. And so she has had access to, I'm sure, the best dermatologists, estheticians, skincare products in the world. And so there is still very much that aspirational element of it. I agree, but essentially anyone in the public eye is probably going to be in that position, are they not? So <laughs> having anyone leading the yeah. way in in such a raw and honest way, I think is helpful for that narrative. I love that she didn't have a stylist though at these events. That's what I loved. I felt that was the aspiration. But she looked <laughs> great. I feel like her fashion at the moment is so spot on. She's letting it all talk, you know, talk for itself. So good on Pamela. I just think... Coming back to that PR stunt angle, if that is the case, we are seeing a really interesting move in terms of brand ambassador marketing and guerrilla marketing. And I just want to raise two of like, I think I, I'm really impressed with them, but it was Michael Sarah potentially hinting at becoming involved with V, the skincare brand, um, and doing this whole PR stunt where he was found in a random pharmacy sort of finding his name on bottles and sticking his <laughs> face so in it. Cool. Like, it's fun. It feels different. It doesn't feel as stuffy as here's the brand ambassador fucking a massive bottle of our product. And then we never hear from it again. I feel like if Sarah V keeps this up, it could be really interesting how it progresses. But yeah, I really want to hear your thoughts on, on Michael Sarah and <laughs> Sarah V. I'd have loved to have been in that board meeting where they went, hey, how can we use this? Our name sounds a little bit like this actor's name. And then somehow it came about and it works really well because obviously Michael Cera is in a lot of comedies and he's this dry wit and it just translates really, really well to that kind of yeah. advertising. And he's not pretending to be a skincare expert either. It's just having, it's just fun. Exactly. It's just silly. I love that. I love that fun. And actually, who better to be an ambassador of a skincare brand and someone who is just not aging right now. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, he's like in that select few of like male Hollywood actors who just are like standing the test of time, not aging at all. But I love it because like that video is clearly staged, but I'm all here for the Sarah and Sarah V. And what I loved is he just looked like he could have worked in that shop. He had that, he had the, all the stickers on a little belt and was like putting stickers of himself on the bottles and just signing it. Like he just seems like such a nice, humble, average guy. And it was just, it's just so cleverly done. It's so, if you saw him in the shop, you would be so excited and yeah, it's it's nice to kind of play on his name. It's a different take. It's getting a celebrity involved, but doing it in a really fun, comical way that actually aligns with what he's known for. So I'm excited to see where it goes and I hope he is an ambassador. I really hope so too. And uh, that maybe brings us on to Owen Wilson, who has been uh, appointed as the chief shampoo officer for California Naturals. That's got to be a made up title, right? Okay. I like it. <laughs> Chief shampoo officer. <laughs> CSO. So how many times a day does he have to wash his hair? Or does he have to wash other people's hair? He does hair? have I delightful don't... hair though, so I he can see the appointment. I can see why. Yeah, he's got great hair. It's it's another it's another unusual appointment, but somehow it does work. And I don't, you think Owen Wilson the fact is a naturals brand that kind of fits in with his whole kind of surfer, cool guy, chilled yeah. out vibe. So I feel like with both of these campaigns, it's lent into what both of these stars are known for. And it's fun, um, especially the Sarah V one. I, I feel like we're talking about creativity in the industry here. What you, uh, Sarah said earlier about Charlotte Tilbury, um, what you were saying about um, Michael Sarah and Sarah V. I feel like there's so much creativity in promotions. It's well, we've gone past the advertising era. And we, we've gone into the era of just fun, interactive things which make people feel good about your brand. Mm. And it's way more memorable. So much more memorable. They, they put out, it must have been almost five minutes, the promotion for with uh, Owen Wilson. 
And he's going through his like morning routine and he's doing all this hair care stuff. Like a get ready with me yeah, kind yeah, of Yeah, yeah, like exactly like a get ready with mm. me. And he goes into the bathroom. He's like, I'm not going to show you this step, guys. And suddenly like there's like flashing lights. And there's like sound effects happening. Like it's so fun, <laughs> you know. And uh, it just also he couldn't be better for a hair care brand. Uh, because he was in Zoolander as a... Oh, my God. He was out oh, yeah. so oh, yeah. He's so hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> Genius. I love it. The so. perfect role. So, yeah, I, I love that. Uh, I'm all for fun and, yeah, just having fun. We, we need it right now, I think. And it's the polar opposite of when Brad Pitt launched his skincare line. Like, disengaged. These kind of, yeah, disengaged and... He hasn't been involved in skincare at all before, and people didn't buy it. They they did they weren't convinced by that partnership, and I think people saw through what it was. It was about the money. It wasn't necessarily about his passion. I for feel skincare. like the genesis of that was, hey, we've got all this wine waste. What do we do with it? And somebody went, aha. Uh-huh. And it does feel a little bit, I don't know, mercenary in a way. Yeah, like you say about that authentic partnership. Similarly to why we're seeing more celebrities go into the investor route, perhaps, than as the faces, the brands, Dua Lipa, Oprah Winfrey, and those yeah, kind of celebrities. Nicole uh, Kidman was Vegemore as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she was. Yeah. And so, yeah, adds credibility to everyone involved. Speaking of divisive opinions, um, Amanda, do you want to take us to your story? Hybrid working has been a big topic of discussion, thanks to L'Oreal CEO Nicholas Hieronymus expressing his discontent towards work-from-home policies recently. In a speech he made at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, Hieronymus said permanent remote workers have, quote, absolutely no attachment, no passion, no creativity. He added, I think it is vital to be in the office. It's about serendipity. It's about meeting people. And it is also more fair to workers because we have lots of young people who have small houses, or have young kids and working from home is actually very bad for their mental health. He also added that returning to the office full-time was fairer to the blue-collar workers that work every day in the factory. Naturally, this got people talking. Um, Cosmetic Business LinkedIn blew up really quickly about this, and we had 322 comments just off the bat, many disagreeing with him. So what do you guys make of his comments on remote workers? Now, when it comes to remote workers, we have to remember there's money involved in the sense of they have expensive offices to justify to the board. Large corporations like this have expenses. They are probably tied into contracts and it's really about the cost of running them. But would they say that? No, of course they wouldn't. It's better to say something like, oh, working from home is bad for creativity or uh, to demonise remote working and ignoring the fact that many artists and founders work alone in studios or in their own living room. I looked at the company filings for L'Oreal UK before this recording and it leases its buildings for its offices and shops, etc. And I only looked at the UK, so bear in mind with these figures. And it said, while it says these contracts are negotiated on an individual basis... It stated that leases are typically made for a period of 10 to 15 years. In 2020, L'Oreal UK signed a deal to move its HQ to White City, which is a commercial district in London, and it eventually moved into this office last year in 2023. Now, according to these most recent filings in 2022, L'Oreal paid 88 million in renting buildings these aren't shops, by the way. Jesus. And uh, yes. <laughs> oh my God. And of that 88 million, it said that 79 million of that was due to the start of its new London headquarters. And now L'Oreal won't be paying 79 million pounds a year, but it will be paying several million pounds per year. And as a cost, L'Oreal needs to justify that. And bear in mind, L'Oreal has offices like this all over the world. So it's very little surprise that they're incredibly pro a return to working from the office. Absolutely. Uh, it's funny you should say that because, as Amanda mentioned, we did have LinkedIn blow up. We had more than 300 comments on this particular post and some of them were saying a very, very similar thing. And interestingly, pretty much everything on there was respectfully or sometimes disrespectfully disagreeing with Hieronymus's take. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning as well. He's not the only beauty founder to call people back. So in December, the Hutt Group, known as THG, 
it required all of the workers who work at its Manchester-based head office to come into the office five days a week, starting from January 2024. So they're another one that's actually made a move to require people to be in. And we even had recently British billionaire Lord Sugar, who you might know from The Apprentice. He is the entrepreneur who runs that show and gives 250000 to a new business. He's recently been criticised for complaining about the concept of remote working. He said that, quote, it's bad for morale. And he kind of said that employees can't learn while working from home, quote, in their pyjamas. However, the internet was very quick to point out that he was video calling in from a remote location rather than going to the studio (laughs) to have the conversation. So the irony was, well, you're working somewhere that best suits you at the time rather than coming in. Even though the L'Oreal comments, I think, very decisive, there are other movements in this area where people are coming out and having very strong opinions on it. So it's not just him. But to play devil's advocate, do you think it isn't the role of the CEO to create a company culture and to do that, you have to be in the office for you to have that culture? It's hard. I think, to be honest, his comments about no attachment, no passion, no creativity... As humans, our processor for being imaginative and creative is our brains. So wherever we're based, (laughs) we have the capability to do it. So I also think as well, like you can create a community, a culture of a workforce where you have people based all over the globe who aren't together, who can all have the same passion and drive to really push a business forward to do incredible things. It's why we have the technology to bring people around the world. If we only employed people who could come into a certain office location you could cut yourself off from amazing people who have incredible skills that aren't actually in your local area. You know, I, I think it's, it's got to be driven from the top. I think it's quite difficult probably for the people who work at L'Oreal to hear this because I think they've got a mix of remote, hybrid and fully in office workers. But I think it's got to be done more on like a case by case basis. Some people might love coming in five days a week. If they want to do that, do that. But if some people have got family commitments or they need other things and they need hybrid working, why not give it to them? Because they're going to give you the best of them in their work for you just giving them some flexibility. So I'm I'm kind of with the LinkedIn gang <laughs> on this. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to say it from the top. Yeah, I'm completely with Amanda on this. Um, anecdotally talking to recruiters in the beauty industry, one of the few upsides of the awful pandemic situation that we had a few years back was that you now have the opportunity to recruit the best talent, you know, a great formulator who maybe lives in uh, Johannesburg or something if you are a Parisian company. So the, the doors are opened to working with some incredible talent because you don't necessarily need everybody local. Those people, they might not be able to travel because they have family commitments. Maybe they have spouses that have to remain in their jobs, whatever it might be. So having the opportunity to really spread your net further when it comes to attracting talent, I think is incredibly useful for companies. And again, as Amanda said, I feel like and I'm not coming for Hieronymus specifically or moulding or or anyone specifically, but I do feel like so many people who are in positions where they make these decisions, they have no idea about the actual day-to-day lives of so many of their employees. All of these things, if you think about your average commute maybe being one hour, right? That is, you have five working days, that's 10 hours You have maybe your lunch break. That's 15 hours that you have to do all the life men chores, which I'm assuming many people in the C-suite position probably outsource to professionals or partners. And frankly, I think there is also a slightly gendered angle, which is a fact that the beauty industry has a lot of women working in it. But at the the real decision making level, there is an imbalance there as well. And I I looked this up because I was curious, but when women are in different sex relationships, women do around 65% of the physical household work. So all these decisions, that's going to impinge on women's lives, on their on the amount of work they're doing outside of their working hours, on their stress levels, on their mental and physical health. And you need your workforce, your employees to be in good mental and physical health. Mm. So I think there's that aspect as well. Absolutely. And for 
people with who are young families who have just had children and things like that as well that remote working can help them get back into work perhaps a bit quicker absolutely and that can be that break and not every country has the same system in terms of subsidizing um, nurseries or nannies and so on and so forth and maternity leave is very different as well globally absolutely and then there's the issue that he said that let's or everyone come into work on Fridays as well <laughs> Yeah, so again, I had a dig. Um, <laughs> um, these are just UK specific, but according to the Office of National Statistics, Tuesdays and Fridays are the most requested days to work from home. So 67% of the UK population who do have hybrid working or do it, and 65% do it on a Friday. Again, I'm just of the thing like, of course you want to have days where everyone's in together, but mandating people come in on a Friday when most of your UK workforce want to work from home on a Friday. Is it necessary? I don't know. don't think so. I don't think we can go back to what it was before COVID. I don't, I think people have had their eyes opened to what it's like to have more time on your hands, to have more time to spend with people around you for time for yourself to not be bogged down by our commutes every day, which drain you and wear you down. And the, one of the funniest comments on this was that, like, the guy was like, oh, yeah, I just feel so much passion and energy when I go to my grey, soulless community <laughs> <of the world." laughs> You know? If you're in your home, if you're where you're comfortable, this is where you write best or, or do your makeup best or whatever creative thing you may do, yeah. why not tap into that? Like, mm -hmm. I think the, the best thing you said was that it should be a case-by-case -case basis. I wish it was that flexible with work. Because it's fair. And like you say, it's people are going to work harder. People who want to be there, who want to put effort in for the job, will respect, you know, respect the company for that. Yeah, it's trust and value. I think so much when your companies look at employee benefits, there's so much focus on salary. And obviously salary is important. It plays an important part. But it's all those other things that will make people loyal and make them remain. It's, it's just a case of, you know, it's different strokes of different folks. People like doing different things. Of course, have set days where you have everybody in. But like you say, if you've got to do a big project or you've got to work on something that needs a lot of concentration, a really noisy office where 30 odd different people are on the phone chatting may not best be the best environment for it. However, if you're having an ideas day for a brand new campaign, of course, have everybody together. This is why instead of going back, have everyone back every week, I think, well, ideally, big businesses should consider balance. Have some days in have some days at home like that works that's been working for a while now you know i think it, as you say a case-by-case -case basis flexibility hieronymus is not wrong in some of what he's saying there will be for example people with four kids who if they're working from home just think jesus christ get me back in the office but that's not going to be the case for everybody and yeah, I think that really has to be taken into account. I do know, again, to maybe play devil's advocate, that L'Oreal, for example, in their um, West Coast US headquarters has invested this in into this incredible space, which uh, has things like, you know, places you can bring your pets and creches. And so it, they are making working from the office easier. But why not have that hybrid? And why not have that hybrid flexible? <music> This is Cosmetics Business Picks, the section of the podcast where we share our favourite products of the past month. In no particular order, uh, Julia, do you want to go first? Happy to. I've selected uh, for this particular episode the Revolution Serum in a Cream, which is from a new brand called And Begin. And it's by the team of dermatologists behind Skinamy, which if you haven't heard of that, it's been around for a couple of years, specialises in personalised skincare. But unlike Skin and Me, Ambigin is specifically aimed at midlife women. It is also a prescription, much like Skin and Me, but the, the idea was that women in middle life, on top of the bespoke ingredients, are probably looking for a wider scope of effective ingredients and also deeper hydration as well. So ideally, a consumer would fill in an online skin consult consultation and they would send up to like four pictures of their, their complexion before being prescribed their serum in a cream. So the version I have trialled wasn't specifically for me. I think it might have been very hard to have done individualised ones uh, to send out to the press. But it did contain 3% encapsulated retinol 
and 5% azelaic acid, uh, which together improve, improve lines, hyperpigmentation and firmness. And it was a lovely product, actually. It was immediately moisturising. It contains uh, bisabolol and uh, ectoin, which we discussed in our last podcast. Again, a shout out to go and revisit that if you haven't heard it. And you also have cosmeceutical actives as well, like Matrixel 3000. So I'm going to do a shout out to the manufacturer Sederma there, because I do like to spotlight ingredients companies as well. So obviously a few days is probably too short a time frame to see any major changes with skincare. But I do look forward to continuing with this. And I don't know, maybe we can do a revisit episode or something in future to see how all of these skincare products that we are trying are going. Yeah, that sounds good. Amanda, do you want to go next? Yeah, so I've been using Batiste's new 24-hour active dry shampoo, which is formulated with new sweat and touch activated technology that claims to keep hair looking and feeling fresh during and after physical activity. The way it works is that you put it on your hair before a workout and it releases bursts of fragrance spheres, which when a user breaks into a sweat, keeps it smelling and looking fresh. I didn't think dry shampoo could be perfected. It's already there. But this is amazing. It's a handbag essential now. I take it every time I go to Zumba because usually I come out and I'm drenched. I put this on beforehand and I also made my friend put it on. We've been trial link for weeks and she's got very tight, cooled, thick hair. And both of us are coming out pretty much near to dry. So it means you can push your hair wash day by an extra day or two. So amazing. I really can't rave about it enough. It really is as good as it says. It does what it says on the tin. Well, I'm going to jump in on the next one. So my pick is Skin Rocks' new The Gentle Exfoliating Toner. It's priced at uh, £49 and it contains AHAs and PHAs. Uh, I've been using about three times a week now, which is what uh, Skin Rocks recommends. And it's really helped with my skin texture, particularly around the chin. You just swipe it over on a pad and yeah, up to three times a week. I have sensitive rosacea redness prone skin and it hasn't caused a problem at all. So yeah, really recommend that to everyone with sensitive skin. Alessandro? Uh, I'll round things off. I just want to say I'm 100% on board with the Sol de Janeiro hype train. And uh, the product I want to talk about is its new uh, Delicia Drench Body Butter, which I want to talk about it because it feels great to apply it to skin. And it's, it's pretty good for you. It helps to uh, protect your natural skin barrier, supports uh, microbiome, leaving it stronger and healthier. But it smells so good. Like, I want to eat it. <laughs> What's the fragrance? It's vanilla orchid and sheer sandalwood. It, it smells like summer in a tub. It's amazing. Um, and I, I think it's so important. They're hitting it so right. Because what's the first thing you do when you open up a cream? Take Anything. A huge whiff. You smell it. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're just it just all smells so good. So keep it up, So, Thank you, Alessandro. That's all now for the Cosmetics Business Podcast. Thank you listeners for joining us today. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate, like, leave a comment, share and subscribe to the Cosmetics Business Podcast so you never miss an episode. Join us next time as we tackle the biggest stories and trends in beauty. And in the meantime, make sure to subscribe to cosmeticsbusiness.com for all of your beauty industry news and analysis. Bye. Bye. Bye.